Okie doke. So if, you've, if everyone has been able to open Illustrator and you have the default <coughs> um, options, if people, somebody hasn't tinkered with it, it should look just like what you see up here. You're going to see the desktop behind the application. To the left, you'll see the tools. <coughs> In the middle, you'll see the, I forget, this is like the welcome window, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You'll see some blank palettes to the right, see some menus to the top, at the top. Everybody have this pretty close? If you don't see the welcome window, that can be changed under preferences, although however your computer has been set up, it may be that you have to change it. Um, we can go to general for a, s a second here, and let's see if it can be changed. So w where you should change um, preferences are under Illustrator, Menu, Preferences, and just select General. And there's a whole series of them that we can go through next or previous, or we can go through all of them here. And I don't know what it would be categorized <coughs> under. Um, let's go to Next, 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 and that's in Display. Maybe it's not here after all. Because there's so much that you can change here, and why it's not here, I don't know. It got turned off. Appearance. Auto add, delete, general. Okay. Not there. <coughs> hmm. Anybody see where it's located? Because if you click here where it says don't show again, it won't show again. In other programs, you click under preferences to bring it back. And why I don't have that here, I don't know. Um, hmm. If you don't have it, it's not the end of the world, but if you do have it, it can be helpful because you'll notice that there's two columns of files. There's open a recent item. It will show any items, you know, a list of about 10 of them, of files that you have used recently. You can also double click on this bottom folder icon, which allows you to click and open from any file on your hard drive or an external drive. You can also create a new file from a template, <coughs> whether it be for a print document, a web document, a mobile device, for video, whatever it is that you want to do. Okay, I'm going to close it for right now, <coughs> and we're going to focus just on the tools, um, the top menu bar, and the um, palettes over to the right. And in CS4, when we get to that, all of, the, all of these will be now called panels, and it will look considerably different than the way it does right now, although fundamentally it's the same. Um, <coughs> all of the panels to the right, or palettes, really have no function at the moment, but for the most part, they add functionality to what you see over to the left. If I select the Type tool, if I select the Move tool, um, they will add, if, if you have the right palettes <coughs> open, they will add functionality. There is no document open for us to, to work on. So all of this stuff does is really no good. So before we can or really do anything, we have to establish a document. To do that, you simply go to File New or New from Template. So if you didn't see that little welcome window, you would do that. Command A N is another option. So we would just want a brand new document. And we'll call this some um, demo one. You can name it whatever you want. Doesn't matter. <coughs> Under the new document profile, we want to select print because in this class, for the most part, we do work from print. Work for print, not for the web. Under size, when it talks about letter, these happen to be the um, page sizes that are default. You can make them any size you like. 
you know, you can make the window any size you like, but letter size is eight and a half by 11, legal is eight and a half by 14, tabloid is 11 by 17. Then we have A4, 3, 5, and B, or A4, A3, B5, and B4 is optional sizes as well. You'll notice down here it has the width and the height in points. <coughs> if you don't know what points are, it doesn't matter at this point in time. I would rather come over here and select it in inches and you'll notice it says eight and a half by 11. We can also select the orientation. Do you want a vertical page or do you want a horizontal page? We're gonna work with vertical right now. If you select horizontal, that's fine because all of those can change as well. We also have some advanced features. If you click on this little advanced button, when you work in print, the default color mode is CMYK. Any raster effects you may use are set by default at high, 300 pixels per inch. Preview mode is set to default. This is fine. If you want to tinker with any of these, default, pixel, overprint, I would just leave them as you see them here, or if they are not what you see here, to change them to what you see here. Okay. <coughs> All of these can be changed at any time. It's just that you should have a pretty good idea when you're starting a document of what page size you're working with, whether you want it vertical or horizontal. Is it for print? If it's for, for print, then the color mode is gonna be CMYK. If you're working for the web, the color mode would be RGB, so on and so forth. Just click OK, and notice how the desktop changes, is that now you have a window and for your document that's titled, in my case, Demo 1, and you'll see an outline in black. This represents the page. Okay. Anything contained within this will print. Anything that lies outside of it will be a part of your file, but it will not print. Okay? That makes sense. So even if I go ahead here and I make a little rectangle, let's make it a nice red, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Make it a red rectangle, <coughs> no stroke. Whoops, there we go that if I leave it within the rectangle, it prints. If I move it outside the rectangle, it's a part of my file, but it is not print. Okay. So this is called the pasteboard out here. Um, in the old days, when before computers, you actually would have an area like <coughs> this that you could place objects that wouldn't, that you could put, you know, there'd be kind of in a holding pattern, things that you would have that could be temporary items, or that maybe you would use them later, maybe the, you wouldn't, and then you could go ahead and bring them in here. Usually, if you were, it would be specified with type, a type that you would receive from a typesetter, that you had waxed the back of it ready for paste up, and you would get it ready for the printer, but you didn't want it to be printed, but you wanted it to be part of that document, okay? So, <coughs> let's <coughs> work with the selection bar along the top, and then let's work with the tools, and then we will get to the palettes. Okay. The tools is a good place to start, and you'll notice that it's broken down into groups. The top group are four tools, then it's broken down into six. Notice that there's slight little, where my mouse is, that there's slight little separations in each of these. Then there's another group of four tools, these are your modification tools. The next group of tools have to do with fills. There's also, for gradients, you can fill with, with symbols. We have, um, if we want to affect colors, we have an eyedropper tool. <coughs> and then below here, we have some others. We have live paint, which we'll talk about. And we have the live paint selection tool, which is an extremely nice tool. And then the, lo the lower four tools down here are the ones that we use if you want to um, 
add a crop area if you want the eraser, which was new to CS3, not available before. We have the hand tool, which is simply allows you to move. It, it's your position and relative to the document. If you want to zoom in, you can use this. That, it looks kind of like a little um, Tootsie Roll Pop kind of thing. This is actually a magnifying glass, so you can zoom in like so by clicking, or you can hold down the Option key and zoom out. And then to move it, you can also hit the space bar, and that allows you to move the page around. Okay. You can also zoom in using keystrokes. I can hit the Command key plus the in the plus key, and that zooms out. And I can hit the Command key and the minus key, and that zooms out. Zooms in, zooms out. Okay, that's another way to zoom in. And there's yet another way, another way. There are about four or five different ways of zooming in, zooming out. And all of them are better than the, zoom, the, the tool itself. Because if I'm on the Move tool, and I don't want to have to come up here with my mouse and to select it, I can always hit Command plus, and that zooms in, and Command minus, and that zooms out. I can hold down the, the Command key and the space bar, and that's not going to let me do it. It should do that. Okay, won't let me do it. Key commands have, ch have been <coughs> changed. So Command plus works good. Okay, so let's start. I'm going to not talk about the first four tools just yet, my selection tools. I want to talk about my basic shape tools here. I have a pen tool, I have a type tool, I have a stroke tool, I have a shape tool here and I have a brush tool and a pencil tool. You'll notice underneath some of these tools, there's a little tick mark on the lower right-hand corner. Does everybody see what I'm pointing to? These little tick marks. That means that there are additional tools that will be found underneath when you click and hold down the mouse. When I click on the rectangle tool and I hold it down, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of other tools that are hidden underneath here. Now, if you get tired of clicking and holding down the mouse, and I want ha to have access to additional tools, I can click, and I can move over to this Tear Off tab here. And then when I release the mouse, notice that this is an independent little window now. And all of these tools are still hidden under here. They don't go away. It's just that I have all of them now that are easily accessible, so that I don't have to actually just go ahead and hold down the mouse on top of that tool to gain access to it. So this is typically how <coughs> working with Illustrator works. It is an object-based program. So every little thing that you do in here is a separate object that can be manipulated or changed separately from all the other objects that you use to create your illustrations. If I start with the rectangular, rectangular rectangle tool, to create the, a rectangle, I simply select the tool by clicking on it, and then I move over to my page, and I click and I drag diagonally. And you'll notice a little blue bounding box appears. And wherever I release is where the rectangle is, is constructed. If I wish to move it, I have to turn off the rectangle tool, and I select one of these two items up here. I select the selection tool or the direct selection tool. I want the selection tool, which is the black arrow tool. And then I can click on the item, and I can drag, and I can move it wherever I want. OK? If I want to get rid of this, <coughs> yeah. you don't have to use the eraser tool. You don't have to come in here and erase like you would in Photoshop to get rid of it. All I have to do is select it and hit delete, and it's gone. That's what I mean by object-oriented. Everything that you create is a separate object that can be um, edited and created independently of all of the others. Now, if I select the circle tool, for example, or the ellipse tool, 
if at any time you want to constrain the proportions of any of these shapes, meaning if I want to make a perfect circle or I want to make a perfect square, you hold down the shift key and you click and you drag. If I release the shift key and I still have my hand on the mouse, notice that it becomes an ellipse, a vertical or a horizontal ellipse. And again, wherever I release the mouse will be where that shape is created. Now, you'll notice at the moment that this particular circle is filled with kind of like a, a, with a reddish orange or an orangish red. And there's no stroke that's defined. There's no outline. That's because I have that feature turned off. But every shape that you create has two inherent properties. One is that it has a fill. And that can be no fill if you wish. It also has a stroke that goes around the outer perimeter of the shape that, again, can be defined as a color and a thickness. Or you can determine, in this case, there is no stroke. There is no thickness. If you, you want to reset the shape to the default settings, you click this little box in the lower left-hand corner where you see the fill and the stroke. It's this one in the left, lower left-hand corner. When you do, while that shape is selected, it turns it back to the default white fill, black stroke. Now, how do I know that this is a white fill and not transparent? Is that if I hold down the Option key and I drag this on top of one another, notice that this circle covers up part of the other circle. So this, in fact, is white. It is not transparent. If I were to select the shape and I were to select the fill at the bottom and select no fill, which is what this stands for, notice that you can now see through it. So each of these properties can be edited and changed at any time you want. If you want a thick stroke, if you want a thin stroke, if you want a blue stroke, if you want any kind of color stroke, you can do that. And the same with all the fills. They can always be changed. If you want to get rid of them, you simply use the selection tool, select it, delete it, hit the delete key, and it's gone. Another powerful tool is that you have at your fingertips is the keystroke Command Z. Who knows what Command <coughs> Z does? It will be your friend. Huh? Undo. That's so that you don't panic. You just hit Command Z. And by default, there should be about 20 undos, maybe 10 to 20, that you have at your fingertips. You just keep hitting Command Z, and it will go back several steps. Another feature that you have at your fingertips that helps you correct a mistake is that you can always revert to save. Now, I haven't saved this file yet, so revert is not an option for me. But that's also a very important one, or F12 revert to save. So whatever the last version is that you saved, if you really muck up your project and you know that the last version that you saved is the one that you want to go back to, you can always revert to saved and that will get you out of a mess too. Okay. So these are all of our tools and this is fundamentally how you create them. And as I selected each of these tools, notice how the menu bar along the top changes. When I select the T key, which stands for text, notice that I have here, it says no selection, but I can go ahead and up here, I have the choice of a fill if I wish. So let's make the text black. Let's make, and notice it's also changing down here as well. I want the stroke none. So I'm gonna pull this over a little bit. Oh, come on. Okay. I can also from here determine if I had a stroke, the point size. If it's a brush, um, the brush panel, I can determine the kind <coughs> of brush that I want to use. And from here, I can determine the character or the font. So by default, Myriad Pro is selected. Let me go ahead and click here. And you can see here all of the fonts that we have loaded in, our in each of the computers. 
What if I want Zep Phenol? I'll just pick that at the very end. So now that's the font I've selected, and now I can select a regular. And if there were options for bold or italic, I would have that available. And I can pick, pick the point size. I'll pick 72 point. And now I can determine the paragraph, so, paragraph whether I want it flush left, centered, or right aligned. And then, again, that's only there because I have the text tool selected. Now I'm ready to, to create my text. So I move wherever I want on the page and I click. And you'll notice it gets pretty large, doesn't it? So I'll just name it text. Okay, I'm done typing the text and I, turn, I click back to the selection tool. And now I can come back and I can move this text wherever I want on the page. Okay. If, on the other hand, I wanted to create, again, a circle that was going to go behind it. When I select the circle or the ellipse tool, notice that, here, why not, let me deselect. I have to make sure that the text is deselected. Select the ellipse, and you'll notice that the, the modification tools up here are slightly different. It still gives me a fill. It still gives me a stroke. I can control the, control the stroke width. I can control the brush type that will fill it. If there is a style, I can specify that. The opacity, I can control that. You know how transparent or opaque it is. Lots of features. That, so th this adds added functionality to whatever I have selected over here. And again, all of these things that you have at your fingertips to change can be changed at any time. All you have to do is select the selection tool, select what you want to change, and if I want to change the fill color, I can do that from up here, I can do that from here, or I can do that from over here, from one of my palettes. I can click here, and click on here, and I, maybe I want it to be red or pink. You notice it changes to pink. If I want to change it back to black, I can go back over here in my toolbox, click and I can select the black, and I click OK, and while the text is still selected, it changes to black. While the text is selected, I can also come up here, and I can change it to blue. OK, so there's three different places. And typically, in Illustrator and most computer programs, there's a, at least three different ways of making changes or to something or creating something, and maybe even more. There's never just one way of doing things. So the more tools you become familiar with, the more you're going to develop a workflow that works well for you. Okay. Now, in addition to the tools that we have up here to create our text, you'll notice down here we have some others. We have the character palette. And if you do not see these, if I close this, and I pull off the paragraph one, and I close this, and I, I pull off the open type one, and I close this, and you don't see any of these, that is OK. Because if you don't see any palettes, or you see a handful of them, where they will be is under the window menu. And you'll notice the ones that are visible are the ones that are checked off. We have Color, Control, Layers, Tools. So if I deselect Tools, notice the Tools go away. So if they disappear, I can hit the Tab key and everything goes away. So if you accidentally hit the Tab key, that will go away. I can come back, go to Window, select Tools, and it comes back. I said I wanted to select the Character palette. Go to Window, Type, Character. And that one comes back. Okay, so if there's any of these palettes that you don't see, any of the tools that you don't see, they will be found under the window menu. Some other useful tips. <coughs> Look in the lower left hand corner of your, um, your document, and you'll see at the bottom here. On mine, it says 100%. Yours might be larger. It might be smaller. This is another way to zoom in, zoom out. <coughs> if 
if I click on here, you'll notice it has some preset percentages. If I want to see this to fit on screen, I can select that. If I want to reduce it, 50%, I can select that. If I want to increase the size to 200% of its print size, I can do that, and it zooms in. Okay, so it's important to take note. You'll also see in the document up here, you'll see this is demo one, 200%. So if you're thinking to yourself, gee, this looks like a good size to print this, and you're expecting it to be this size, you may be surprised when you actually print it and discover it's not this size, but in fact, we go back and I change from here back to 100%, and that what you get is actually something that's this size. It's, you know, it's half the size. So what you may want to do from time to time, especially when you're getting ready to print, is view it at 100%, so you'll get a pretty good idea of what it will look like about that size when you're ready to print. There's another feature that's right next to it, and it says never saved. <coughs> what we can do is if you select here under show, it says version queue status, current tool, date and time, number of undos, document color profile. It's up to you. I mean, I don't need to, it to tell me what current tool I have. I know what tool I have selected. Version queue status is Version Q is available for editing, modifying documents, and you can work between different versions if you wish. Don't usually use that in this class. Current tool, I think, is sort of a waste. Date and time is a waste because you have that in the upper right-hand corner up here. So that's redundant. The only thing I really like to see here are the number of undos, and it tells me I have 36 undos available to me. So I can keep track of that. <clears throat> Everybody knows how to scroll, scroll left and for, um, if I lose track of where my document is, you know, I've scrolled one way or another and I can't find it, the best way to get it back is to come down here to the bottom and go back to the bottom and say fit on screen and it will go, it will bring you back to where you belong and then you can you know, if you lose sight of it, if I scroll up and I wonder, oh, shoot, where am I, or if it's too small. Because you can zoom way in and way out on some of your documents. If I hit Command minus, you know, it could be here, or I could hit Command plus. If I'm viewing this at 6,400%. And I can hold down the space bar and I can be moving this around thinking, well, I gotta be here somewhere. And it's way in the corner someplace and I don't see where it's going to be. You know, so the easiest way, <coughs> remember I said there's multiple ways of doing this. I can also go to view <coughs> and I can come down here, actual size, or I can say fit in window. It's the same place, command zero, command one, and it brings me back. And to get rid of the text, again, I can hit the delete key if I want to edit the text and put another font in there, change the color. I can always do whatever I want to that. That's pretty helpful. Um, other useful tools that will be available to you. You're going to want to align items. You're going to want to size items. So how do you do that? Um, to measure them, you have a grid available to you and you have rulers. To bring up the rulers, just hit Command R or go View. And if we bring down here, the mouse down about midway, it says Show Rulers. And depending on what settings we have, we can view the ruler in pixels, points, inches, centimeters, millimeters, you name it. Depends on whatever unit of measurement works for you. I like inches if I'm working in print, I like pixels if I'm designing for the web. Once you have the rulers visible, then you may want guidelines. Guidelines will help you to align elements on a page. <coughs> um, guidelines are non-repro blue lines that help you 
organize your, do, your, your layout. And to bring those out on the page, you move the mouse over one of the rulers, and you click and you drag. And let's say I want to create, want to know where I'm the middle of my page is. So I know that it's eight and a half inches, so I move over four and a quarter, and I release, and you see the light blue line. That does not print. That can be moved later on. That can be deleted. But if I want all of my elements to align exactly in the middle of my page, I have these guidelines available for me, and I can bring out as many as I want. I can also turn anything into a guideline as well. Again, this harkens back to the old days when paste-up artists worked with non pre non-repro blue pens and pencils to paste up their, their camera-ready um, art. And it's still there today. <coughs> okay? So those are some other things that you have at your fingertips to work with, too. The palettes can be organized any way you want. You can create your, these to suit your own specific workflow. You do not have to rely on the default settings. And for example, I have this character palette that I use a lot. Notice that I can click in the little top menu bar and drag it, and I can move it underneath. And when I see this blue <coughs> line and I release, now it's a part of that. And to collapse this, I can click on this little, these little double arrows in the upper right-hand corner. And now to notice that it, it actually gives me a bit more real estate and I still have access to each of these, but I just simply click on the icons instead, and they pop out. If at any time you want to move these out and you want them separate, just simply click on that tab and drag it out, and now it's moved away from that. If you want to bring it back in, click and drag and move it to the side or move it to the bottom or move it in, and you'll see it highlight in blue and that puts it back in. There are some default settings for viewing all of these. <clears throat> and they can be found under Window, or I'm sorry. Yeah, Window, and it should be, hold on here. Each program does it slightly different. Workspace, and you'll notice that I have two of them here. We have the basic workspace, which isn't bad. And when we click here, you see how it opens up, and we have all of our basic palettes. We also go to men menu um, or window, and we come down here under, um, oh shoot, once again. <coughs> I've already lost track of it. Where did it go? Oh, it's, I'm sorry. I'm looking down here on some programs, and it's up here. Workspace. I didn't want to create a new document. Oh, shoot. OK. Brings me back to where I was. I need to go. Let's go to Window, Workspace, and let's select Type. Maybe you're creating a print document that deals a lot with type, so you want all the type panels visible. So it automatically toggles back and forth. You can also customize it, as I've done. And you can pull these everywhere. I can pull this here. I can close some, window, <coughs> some palettes. I can open some others. And then you can go to Window Workspace, and you can say Save Workspace. Title it, as I've done. And you can see I already have two of them here. If I want to look at Kirk's Workspace, this is one that I saved. That maybe that's how I want my workspace laid out. And it will always return to that same, those same settings, exactly where you place these items. So even though I may close some of them, and even though I may move them around, like so, if I go back and I go to Window Workspace and I go to Kirk's Workspace, it goes back to that original default setting. So you can customize this any way you like. OK? Everybody getting the hang of working with this a little bit? Or maybe you were already comfortable. How many, again, have worked with Illustrator a little bit before? 
for most of you. So this is kind of redundant for most of you, right? Or are you learning anything new? A little bit? Yes? No? I don't know. You are or aren't? It is some new things? Huh? Okay. The workspace? There might be little things here and there that maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Um, you know, I'm always learning new stuff myself. So I'm going to go back to basics. And we can open this up for the panels when we have them. And we're fine. Okay, so it's a basic overview. We also have access to the bridge. How many of you have <coughs> used bridge before? If you're familiar with Photoshop, you would be. Um, bridge is an ancillary tool that was originally developed for Photoshop, but now it's used in conjunction with all Adobe products. And it allows you to view documents and, to a certain degree, edit parts of them without actually opening them. And you can also view the metadata and also rotate, change files, do a variety of things. So if I click on this little button here on Bridge, down at the bottom you'll notice little brown tool. It says Bridge, CS3 will launch. And the reason I'm doing that now is because I'm going to open the first exercise and you guys don't need to follow along with me because I'm, I only have the one for CS3 loaded in here. I need to take the ones from my CS4 book and put it on here. Although the settings are pretty close to the same. In fact, they're almost identical for either one. In fact, it is identical. Oh well, not a big deal. Okay, so you'll notice that the last time I opened this, I had this for a Photoshop file. I can view files on the computer. And this is what I have over here under Favorites. I can also click the tab on Folders. And I can look in my hard drive. Okay. And you'll see that there's a number of folders in my hard drive. And if there are any files that can be opened, I can find them in here. I can look in Documents. I can look just about anywhere. Um, I'm going to look here for a minute. In fact, I may not have it here that I can. Here's some exercise files, but these are from another. App. These are my flash ones, so never mind. That doesn't help us. How about here? That's some from something else too. That's a desktop. Why am I looking there? I don't want to look on my desktop. I'm going to have to open this from a slightly different place. So that doesn't help me. Why don't I see that under a computer? I know why. No, I don't know why. Because I have something saved someplace else, and that's why. OK, let me do something real quick. So everybody close their eyes so I can make this change. <coughs> Um, for the time being, I do have some files saved under my computer that will be accessible to all of you. I'm gonna, these are my public files. And here are lessons which, are be, which would be for Illustrator. So here's this one and this one. Let me just select all of them and I'm going to move them out here and make copy of them on the desktop. And I will show you in a little while how you will have access to these. And I'll make access, um, the CS4 files um, accessible as well. OK, so I have them here. Here are my lessons. And I'm going to go back to my <coughs> hard drive. Here's the computer. Let's look on the desktop here. And we'll see one down here that says Lessons. Lesson 0. Notice how I can access them all from here. I can also take this lesson folder and put it, drop it in. Oh, why won't it let me put it in favorites? Come on. Let's go ahead here. Let's go ahead from here. 
and I'm going to do it from here. I have desktop. Oh, I know why I didn't have that, that ac accessible before. Because I clicked on Miller here. There we go. Now I can have public. I can double click on public. And here are my folders inside public. I didn't need to copy it after all. Um, I thought I copied it. I thought I copied it. Okay. Close your eyes once again. Now I've got to put them back. Let's put it back in here. Put it back in Miller. Let's put it back in public. I thought I'd made copies of it. Yeah. So why isn't it here? <coughs> Should be visible here. Oh, here they are. I'm looking right at it. Double click on lessons, and you can see here's you know lesson one, and without e actually even opening it, it takes a second, depending on the time it takes to, to open it up. I can preview the files without having to open them. You know, sometimes it's difficult when you're viewing your images, your files from little icons. You know, which one was it? Was it version one or two or three? I don't remember. Yeah, so now, okay, we can look at them all without having to open the file. Very cool. So we'll go back. That's the content of that folder. I'm going to go back to Miller again. I'm going to go ahead and double click on public, double click on lessons, and let's look at lesson one. Okay, so here's a start file. Here's a, an image of Yellowstone. Um, pretty interesting. This is kind of a side note. We can zoom in from here. Notice that we can see detailed of that. Um, Illustrator, if you're not aware, but was designed as a technical drawing program a long time ago. And it's um, become something a lot more over the years. But if you're into cartography, you know, designing maps and stuff, it does a darn nice job. So there's one. Brochures is something else that you can design with it, and we'll see lots of other examples, too, of um, things that are more illustrative, more painterly. But <coughs> it does a heck of a job with type, and this would be a good example of one of those. So I'm going to go back again to um, <coughs> Let me go back again to, I'm going to go back to Miller once again. I'm going to go back to Public, and I want to go back to Lessons. And I'm going to go back to Lesson 2 now, which is what I'll focus on now. And you'll see there's three different files that I can view. And I don't have to open them. I can view them without having to open them. It's really pretty nice. I can also shrink this. <coughs> And you'll notice that there's a lot of metadata that it gives me here. Metadata tells me the file name. It tells me the document type. It gives me the application that was used to create it. It tells me the date it was created, the date it was modified, the file size, the dimensions, all sorts of stuff. It tells me the plates. It tells me, meaning this was done in CMYK. It gives me the document swatches. If there's any audio that was added, video, you name it. All kinds of information that's available to you here. When you're working especially with Photoshop documents, incredibly important. It will tell you with a digital camera what kind of camera was used to take it, what day was taken. If you have a certain kind of camera with GPS in it, it will tell you where in the world you were when that photograph was taken within a, matter, you know, a couple of feet. It's amazing. The, the information that's in there. It'll tell you the f-stop, the aperture, all kinds of stuff, the shutter speed, you name it. The, all this metadata. And it can also be used to organize all of your files because you can add keywords. You can put in here, here's all the images that I used or I created for my son's birthday. And you can add keywords to each of these documents. And before you know it, you can do your own search and you can find them and organize your files very nicely. Well, I want to open all three of them. So I can hold down the shift key and notice that I can compare them side by side. 
and I have them all selected, and all I have to do is double click on any one of those three, <coughs> and all three files open. And I really don't need the bridge anymore for the time being. I can go back to it, and I can hide it, or I can close it. For those of you who are not Mac users, that's what the red, yellow, green stands for. Red means that it's closed. The amber will put it in the dock, and the green will allow you to see it full size. Okay. So one of the things that you'll be doing quite a bit of in here, I'm going to go ahead and close that file, are selecting files. And there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can select files. A lot of ways. Some of them very efficiently, some of them not so efficient. So let's start. Um, let me see where I am with time with my video. As I may be. Oh, quite a bit of time left. Okay, I'm in good shape. So once you've created files <coughs> or, or images, <coughs> shapes, whatever you want to call them, and you want to select them, the best thing to do is to use, let's pull this off right here, this select tool, and I can just click and notice that it's selected. It's defined by a bounding box. You see these little anchor points, and it's in blue. What if I want to select the other one? There's a couple of ways that we can do this. I can also hold down the Shift key, and I can click on it. And now I have both of them selected. What if I also want to select the hat at the bottom, but I don't want to select the fish, the apple, or the other hat? Hold down the Shift key and select it, too. Now, a bounding box goes around all of them, but notice that only these three, you see the little path with the anchor points around them. These are the only three that are selected. And how do I know that? When I click and I drag and I move them, it's just those three, sh those three shapes. So that means that I can change the properties of all of these. I can add strokes. I can change the size. I can move them. I can do all sorts of things to them if I only want to change those three. There's other ways to do that. You can also click and drag to select multiple. I can click and drag, and notice that with the, again, the selection tool, and you see this little bounding box. And if I decide I want just these top four selected, I make sure that the bounding box is around all four and release the mouse, and you'll see that all four are selected. So that is another way to select, okay? Another way might be the lasso tool selection tool. The lasso selection tool allows me to click and drag around the shapes that I want to that I want to select, and now that those three once again are selected. So that's again another way of selecting. We can also select using the magic wand tool. So let me deselect first. In the magic wand tool, if I click in there. Notice I clicked in the red fill, but notice that the fish was also selected because I was making my selection based on fill color, and this fish has the same fill color. So if I had 100 shapes in here that were all every, every which way, if I used that magic wand to just click on one, all of them would be selected if that's what I wanted. So it can be a very efficient way of selecting multiple shapes with, by only selecting one, if that makes sense. <coughs> there is another way that we can select. You can select, select by the same fill color, the same stroke, a whole bunch of different kinds of attributes. And so how we do that, if I select this one, let's select this hat, and I want to select the other hat. Let's say, but I have a whole bunch of other things that I have selected. I can come under Select, and I can select Same, and I can choose by Blending Mode, Fill and Stroke, Fill Color, Opacity, Stroke Color, Stroke Weight. So if I select by Fill Color, which other one do you think is going to be selected? The other hat. That's all. Move outside the shapes and click, and they're deselected. I can also, if I select one of these, 
again and I select and I select same and I select stroke color or stroke weight and I do that notice that they're all selected why is that because they all have no stroke <coughs> or that it's all the same weight now there's something hanging over here somewhere oh we got the little clouds over here okay so that was something I didn't realize that we had in here that was selected. So these tools here select by same blending mode, fill and stroke, fill color, opacity. So if I selected these three, for example, and I change the opacity to 50% as an example. And then I came back and you notice that they are all three separate colors but they do share the same opacity. So I can come back to select same opacity and notice that the, all those three are selected. Actually, no, what do I have? I didn't select the right ones. Let me select one of these. There we go. Select that one. Select um, same opacity. There we go. Wait a minute. <coughs> Isn't that what I selected? Let me deselect again. Select one. Select same opacity. Something's not working. Why is that? Because these two have the same opacity, and this one should be selected. So there's something wrong here. That's 50%, that's 50%, that's 50%. That's 100%, 100%, 100%. So if I select this one, select same opacity. There's something wrong. Doesn't work all the time. Oh well. And if I really screw up, remember I said you can always go to File, Revert to Saved, and it takes me back to my last version. Okay. To move an object to change its properties, you have to select it. So if I decide that I want to change this airplane to be the same color as the apple and the fish, you need to select it first. Not always, but that's one way of doing it. Then I can select from here, see the um, eyedropper, and I can click inside the apple or the fish, okay, and it fills here, and then I can go ahead and click inside. Oh, come on, don't do that. Hold down the option key, and then I can fill it. We can also do that without selecting. Again, I can use the eyedropper. I can select, and it fills the foreground color or the fill color with that amber color. I can hold down the option key, and I can click on another shape, and it will fill it with that color. Similarly, I can apply strokes. If I go ahead and I apply a stroke to one of them, <coughs> and I decide that I want a black stroke and I want it to be maybe a two point, three point, four point, nice big bold stroke around that. And I want to apply that same stroke to all of these. Again, with the stroke in the foreground down here, I can select the little eyedropper and I can click from here, pull down the option key and click. And now I've added the stroke as well as the fill to each of these as, as well. Okay, so those are all the ways and pretty pretty much that you can select. There's also if you look under the direct selection tool, which is this white arrow, there are two additional options here. The direct selection tool, when you click on a path, allows you to select individual anchor points. You'll notice that when you see a shape, that it's comprised of additional points. And you see what, what all of these little white boxes. If I click on one of these, I can move and change the shape of this dramatically. 
So I'm not restricted. I don't have to keep the shape of this object. To do that, again, you use the direct selection tool and select on the shape, and then you'll see if you select on the, the edge, I can manipulate this any way I want, any of these anchor points. I also have something called a group selection tool, which is what this is, the one with the white arrow and the plus tool. So what does that do? Right now I don't have any groups, but what if I selected this shape? this one and this one, and I hit Command G or I selected Option Group. These are now a group. <coughs> Even though they're not connected to one another, anytime I select one with the selection tool, the others are selected. And if I move one, if I resize one, they all are resized or they are all rotated or they are all function as a single entity. But what if I wanted to manipulate one within that group and leave the others intact? Then what you have to do is use the group selection tool. Then I can click on one in here, or I can select one point, and I can move it. And when I come back and I use the selection tool, notice that those three are still selected. It's still part of the group. I've been able to manipulate one element within the group, but it's still part of the group. Does that make sense? Any questions about selecting? You move outside the shape and click on the, cl the, the clipboard and deselect, and that's how you deselect. You can also click and you can just hit D, wait a minute, no, wait a minute, what is it? Escape? I can't remember. I'm so used to just moving outside and clicking, I've forgotten the key command for it. Remember for to deselect? <coughs> I can't remember. And it's probably something I should know and I can't remember. You can also ungroup these when you're done too. So I can always, you know, nothing is permanent in this program. I can always select a group and I can go back to <coughs> object and I can select ungroup. Now when I deselect them and I select the individual objects, see they're all independent of one another now. So it depends on the kind of illustration that you're building. So that's simply selecting, deselecting, all the different ways of selecting and deselecting objects. Typically, the way you construct an illustration is as follows, that you make it in all of its individual little parts. Remember I mentioned last week, I said it's easiest if you think of it about working with little cutout pieces of paper. Sometimes they can get really intricate. Okay, sometimes they can look very simple and basic like you, what you see here you see the little flowers, okay? But you'll look to, to the right and you'll see the finished product. You'll look to the left and you see all the individual components. And each of these objects, okay, it, it's the case with Illustrator that every time you create a new object, a, a new shape, it's automatically layered on top of the last one. So even though they might be lie within the same layer, within that layer they could be stacked on top of one another. So if I select this here and I move it over, you'll see that they've already layered it for me. It's beneath this one. So even though I might move this one here like so, and I move this around, and I can use my arrow keys to nudge it up or nudge it down, they already have this set for me. The, the order is just fine. And I can use my arrows to nudge it up and down one pixel or two. It's pretty nice. Now when I select this one, you'll notice that it's selected as a group, which is pretty nice. So now when I move this over like so, it fits quite nicely. But you'll notice now we have these individual parts. And now I have a bit of a problem here because you'll see that the veins of the 
the leaves are independent. The little, um, what do you call it? I guess these would be like this. I can't think of what these are called. Seeds, whatever. I don't know. Well, the best way to work with this would be, because you'll notice it's used for this flower, the same one is used for this flower as well as this flower, but they're different sizes. So what I would do is I would select all four just by clicking and dragging. Remember I said that was one selection method. Hit Command G to make a group out of it and move it in place. So I have that one set. Now I need one for over here. Why make it again? You can just hold down the Option key and we can drag it over. But now it's the wrong size, isn't it? But it's not a problem. We can always resize it. Now I can hold down the Shift and the Option key and that will allow me to resize it, not diagonally, but from the center. And now I can click on a corner and resize it. And I've got it done in a heartbeat. And if I had to rotate it, I could do that too. The same with these elements that I want for the, the veins and the leaf. I would rather see these as a group. I don't want to accidentally put, put these together and then accidentally move the individual objects. So I'm going to select them. And I'm going to hit Command G for group them to group them. And now I can simply move it in place. Now you'll notice that it's at the wrong angle. Not a problem. This gives this program gives us all kinds of tools to rotate. When you see the selection box, I can move over the corner. And when you see the little curved double arrow, that allows me to click and drag and to rotate it. Now I can move it in place. And again, I can use my arrows to, to get it the way I want it. Or you'll notice that maybe I need the leaf itself to be moved. That maybe it needs to come down and lie a little flatter. Well, we also have something <coughs> called the rotation tool. And when you have the object selected that you want to rotate, Maybe I want to pivot it along, I want the rotation to pivot in the lower corner here. So I select the rotation tool and I click at this point here and then I move, notice the little target. Then I move outside and I click and I drag and you can see how it rotates. And I can move it up and I can spin it around and I can have it rotate however I want. I can go back and I can select <coughs> this one, or maybe I should have selected both, and the same thing. Click the rotation tool, click here for the point about which I want it to pivot, rotate it a little bit, and I've got it. And now I can move it, and I can move it in place. But this is fundamentally how it works. Now, if you want to see the stacking order of all of these, you would have to look in your layers panel. Now you'll see the locked one, that's the flower to the right. This is the one that they created for us. But then on a separate layer on top of it, we have the one that we created. And when we click and we twirl down, here are all of the shapes that comprise this particular illustration to the left. It looks so simple, and yet look at all of the shapes that we've created. And within each of these groups, there are additional shapes. So imagine what a really full-blown, complex illustration looks like and how many shapes you have to deal with. It can be overwhelming if you don't organize things properly. It will be, there, there are new improved ways of selecting items um, in CS4 when we get to that. But it can be really a, um, a challenge sometimes. Now, you'll notice in this that they already had a group for us. But if I wanted to move individual elements within that group, I would have had to use the group selection tool. Then I can click any one of these elements inside it. And I could change the color, I could change the <coughs> scale, I can move it, I can do whatever I want, and it still remains a part of that group. Now, the last extra part of the exercise I've already kind of done. And I don't remember step by step 
how we're supposed to do this, but again, <coughs> if I were to select just one part of a French fry, and you can see with all of these shapes overlap, sometimes it's difficult to select some of the others that you want by them being overlapped. Well, I could select them from over here in my layers panel and see all the shapes. Notice again, see how many shapes there are that comprise this illustration? Quite a few. But what I can also do is I can do select, and again, I can do same, and I'll just say stroke color or maybe stroke weight. Now you can see all of them are selected, and now if I want to change the weight, I want to change its color, I want to change its properties, I can do so. Now we can go ahead and we can go ahead and change the weight. Make it all a uniform thickness, maybe six point. And now they're changed. So it makes for a very effective way to work. I can go ahead and I can select one star, and what if I want all of the stars to be selected? Well, with one selected, I can go select same fill color. Now all of the stars are selected and I can change the color of them, even though some of them might lie behind other shapes and be difficult to gain access to. <coughs> so they're just trying to show you various ways of organizing and selecting and cha making changes because nothing in Illustrator is absolutely permanent. It can all be changed very simply. So, well, simply. Sometimes a little bit more complex means than others, but it's all very doable. Nothing is permanent. Nothing, nothing, nothing is permanent. It can always be changed. Okay. Let me see where I am with time. I'm probably ready to turn off the video recorder, and I hope to have that up tonight for you. more minutes. <clears throat> are there any tools or principles that I've covered so far that are n that you want me to review? Because all of this will be found in the book. And some of it a little bit more, some of it not. To give you an idea of the range of the different types of illustrations you can do in Illustrator, that's probably one more thing that I should talk about. <coughs> Is again, I can go back to Bridge if I like. We can go inside the computer, double click, and we can go inside of Applications. I'm going to scroll down to Adobe Illustrator. Inside Adobe Illustrator are some cool extras, and that should be some sample files, sample art. Now you'll see a whole bunch of these. Let's look at some of these. Um, you saw an example of a map, which for technical drawings are really very good. There's some nice effects that can be applied. Um, and you'll see that it, the, the type here looks like it's a neon. Some really, really nice effects. Beautifully designed, beautifully crafted and illustrated, but there's some unique effects that have been added here that really add some punch to it. Um, anybody old enough to remember or be aware of the kind of Haight-Ashbury days of the 60s? Similar kind of illustration. What I think you should take note of is look at the type and how it conforms to these different kinds of shapes. And that's something that um, Illustrator is really good at is type and using type and manipulating it in just about any way you see fit. It is really, really good at that. The types of, of illustrations that you see in here, the Cheshire Cat, and that sort of thing, the little umbrella and stuff. Flat 2D graphic shapes are pretty typical. But there's a whole bunch of other, uh, other range of types of illustrations that you can do. <coughs> if I select this one, would you believe that this one was done in Illustrator 2 and it looks a lot more photographic? And this was done using 
a tool called a gradient mesh. And it is time consuming, but to do something like this is not that difficult, but just tedious. Likewise, you can also do something like this. And this just takes a lot of time and effort and looking carefully, but it's using some very basic tools to put together something pretty elegant and nice. Very different from the 2D images that we're, we're looking at here. All capable, you know, same program. If you want something more on the cartoony approach, you know, the old Ed Big Daddy Roth style illustrations, very similar. Cool effects applied to a type. Again, really, really nice. Some, you know, fun cartoony features. This one is nice too for a more cartoony approach. But beautifully crafted, elegant design, really nice approach. What it's being used for a lot these days, some more things that we can cover in a couple of minutes here, is com combining photography with, with illustration. And that is, you can see that the guy here with the hat and the aerosol can was originally generated from a photograph. But they used live trace to trace the photograph and to make it look, and, and to convert it from a bitmap to a vector graphic. And then they removed elements of it and kept others so it looked somewhat posterized. If you remember, there was the DJ one on my website, similar technique. This is pretty popular today, combining photographic elements with illustration using the live trace and live fill to create some pretty interesting effects. Another useful feature too with the live trace and live color effect is cartooning. In the past, there were, um, if I click in here and you can see, okay, you would start with a basic, a clean drawing, whether it be done in pencil or pen or ink or whatever. <clears throat> and then it would take someone who was the, the, if you like comic books, there was an inker and painter that would come in and they would take the, the blue line pencil drawing that the illustrator drew and on a separate sheet they would trace and they would carefully ink and then they'd carefully color, hand color. Now if you have a really good drawing, you can use something called auto trace and now you can convert that drawing into a very clean inked drawing that looks like it's inked. And then when you're done with that, you can use live paint to very quickly go back in and, and fill in the colors any way you like. You can work with pre-existing palettes to make sure that they're all consistent and bang, bang, bang. Once the initial drawing is done, these steps take little or no time at all to complete. Very effective way to work. I mean, when I saw that, become available, I think it was the first version of, ca of, um, C of um, the Adobe suite, <coughs> it blew me away because I knew that it was going to put a lot of people out of business, a lot of people out of work. Because those inkers and painters, I mean, if, if, if it took a half a dozen people to do that, you know, now it just takes one person sitting there and in a short time they can just <coughs> sit at the computer and do what it took several people before. Just like Photoshop put traditional retouchers out of business. Just like Illustrator and desktop publishing put typesetters out of business. It's the same thing. You know, I mean, it, it, it has transformed the business tr dramatically. The things that you see in type, done in type here, um, that's all live, had to be done by hand in the past. And it was very tedious, very costly, expensive. Now it can be done at a fraction of the time fraction of the cost. So it, it's really trans, all of these programs, Illustrator being probably the first because it was developed in 1988, transformed the industry dramatically. It put type, it helped to put typesetters out of business. <coughs> it transformed the way design was done. You didn't need paste up boards and artists anymore. It could be done directly by the designer. Amazing what it can do now. Just from concept to completion and a heartbeat. Just takes the same person and that's it. <coughs> so these are some of the examples. Um, other things that you can do too. This is um, product <coughs> or um, product design, but also um, package design and um, labels. 
And you can see, you know, the same aqua kind of design here, just different color schemes. And in CS3, when they introduced <coughs> the new color features, just amazing. How many of you have used Illustrator before have used this? The new features. Pretty amazing, huh? And just really, really very nice. They've even added that used cooler online for color schemes and things like that. Very nice. So you can see the range of illustrations that <coughs> can be done and we'll probably be doing in this class. But it starts off just getting a feel for the way that this tr program works working with objects, working with layers, different ways of selecting, deselecting, manipulating them, moving them. So you feel co comfortable with that first. And then when you do, then we have a whole slew of tools to build the objects and to join them together. And to put them, piece them together as a single. That if we go back now, when I close this, and we look at the flower, and I turn off, Turn this back on. If I were to revert to the saved version here, file revert. <coughs> you just see on the one hand a bunch of separate elements, pieces, but when they are put together, it's a gestalt where the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? so that you don't see these in it as individual kind of weird elements. You see them as flowers now. And that's really fundamentally how all of the illustrations are constructed. Even the flower with the, you know, the, with the petals and that sort of thing and the gradient mesh tool. If I were to open that, let me go back again. Let me open that to show you. That would be a good ex example of an extreme different difference. Um, and then that will be it. Okie doke, so I have the flower with the stem and the leaves. But think of them as individual elements. If I select, use the selection tool and I click on each individual leaf, they're all separate. Individual petal, individual stem, they're all individual elements. So there's a variety of tools that you can use to create the overall shape of the leaf and that you'll see inside here, in fact, you see the grid inside? Okay, that's using this tool over here, the gradient mesh tool, to convert this to a mesh, which enables you to apply color in a very specific way, almost like an airbrush or a watercolor tool. So you just pick it apart piece by piece, but this is no different than the other flower we just created. I mean, it's constructed in the same manner, you know, fundamentally the same. Okay, so I'm done talking for a bit. What I'm going to do is show you, I'm going to turn the video recorder off and show you, since not all of you do have the textbook, how to gain access to my files so you can do the exercises. If you want to take about a 10 minute break, you can. A couple of people that are new, I need to get their names and um, show them where to go for the syllabus and all that good stuff.